Gettysburg remains the Civil War's bloodiest battle. In just three days, up to 23,000 Yankees and 28,000 Confederates were killed, injured, or captured. Legendary generals such as Lee, Longstreet, and Meade clashed in the fields and orchards near Gettysburg. Today, we will find out soldiers' and generals' reactions to this horrifying battle. George Gordon Meade, leading the United States Army of the Potomac, first clashed at Gettysburg in July 1863. I have the honor to submit here with a report of the operations of this army during the month of July last, including the details of the Battle of Gettysburg. On June 28, I received the orders of the President of the United States, placing me in command of the Army of the Potomac. The situation of affairs at that time was briefly as follows. The Confederate Army, commanded by General Robert E. Lee, estimated at over 100,000 strong, of all arms, had crossed the Potomac River and advanced up the Cumberland Valley, reliable intelligence, placed his advance on the Susquehanna at Harrisburg and Columbia. My own army, of which the most recent return showed an aggregate of a little over 100,000 men was situated in and around Frederick, Maryland, extending from Harper's Ferry to the mouth of the Monocacy, and from Middletown to Frederick, on the 30th General Buford having reported from Gettysburg the appearance of the enemy on the Cashtown Road, in some force, General Reynolds was directed to occupy Gettysburg. On reaching that place on July 1st, General Reynolds found Buford's cavalry warmly engaged with the enemy. Major General Reynolds immediately moved around the town of Gettysburg and advanced upon the Cashtown Road, and without a moment's hesitation deployed his advance division and attacked his enemy. The arrival of reinforcements for the enemy outflanked our line of battle and pressed it so severely that about 4 p.m., Major General Howard deemed it prudent to withdraw these two corps to the Cemetery Ridge on the south side of the town, which operation was successfully accomplished. Not, however, without considerable loss in prisoners, arising from the confusion incident to portions of both corps passing through the town, and the men getting confused in the streets. About the time of this withdrawal, Major General Hancock arrived whom I had dispatched to represent me on the field, on hearing of the death of General Reynolds. During the heavy assault upon our extreme left, portions of the Twelfth Corps were sent as reinforcements. During their absence, the line on the extreme right was held by a very much reduced force. This was taken advantage of by the enemy, who, during the absence of Geary's division of the Twelfth Corps, advanced and occupied a part of his line. With this exception, the quiet of the lines remained undisturbed till 1 p.m. on the 3rd, when the enemy opened from over 125 guns, playing upon our center and left. This cannonade continued for over two hours. When our guns, in obedience to my orders, failing to make any reply, the enemy ceased firing, and soon his masses of infantry became visible, forming for an assault on our left and left center. The assault was made with great firmness, directed principally against the point occupied by the Second Corps, and was repelled with equal firmness by the troops of that corps. This terminated the battle, the enemy retiring to his lines, leaving the field strewn with his dead and wounded, and numerous prisoners in our hands. July 5th and 6th were employed in succoring the wounded and burying the dead. I determined to follow the enemy a flank movement, and accordingly, leaving McIntosh's brigade of cavalry and Neal's brigade of infantry to continue harassing the enemy, put the army in motion for Middletown, Maryland. The result of the campaign may be briefly stated in the defeat of the enemy at Gettysburg, his compulsory evacuation of Pennsylvania and Maryland, and withdrawal from the upper valley of the Shenandoah, and in the capture of three guns, 41 standards, and 13,621 prisoners. 24,178 small arms were collected on the battlefield. Our own losses were very severe, amounting, as will be seen by the accompanying return, to 2,834 killed, 13,709 wounded, and 6,643 missing, in all, 23,286 men. It is impossible in a report of this nature to enumerate all the instances of gallantry and good conduct which distinguished such a hard-fought field as Gettysburg. I will only add my tribute to the heroic bravery of the whole army, officers and men, which under the blessing of divine providence, enabled a crowning victory to be obtained, which I feel confident the country will never cease to bear in grateful remembrance. Very respectfully, your obedient servant. General Robert E. Lee to General Wilcox on July 3rd, 1863, at the Battle of Gettysburg after the failure of Pickett's charge. This has been a sad day for us, a sad day. 
but we can't always expect to gain victories. Never mind, General. All this has been my fault. It is I that have lost this fight, and you must help me out of it in the best way you can. The position occupied by the enemy opposite Fredericksburg being one in which he could not be attacked to advantage, it was determined to draw him from it. In this way, it was supposed that the enemy's plan of campaign for the summer would be broken up. Actuated by these and other important considerations that may hereafter be presented, the movement began on June 3rd. The leading division of Hill met the enemy in advance of Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st. Driving back these troops to within a short distance of the town, he there encountered a larger force with which two of his divisions became engaged. Ewell, coming up with two of his divisions by the Heidlersburg Road, joined in the engagement. The enemy was driven through Gettysburg with heavy loss, including about 5,000 prisoners and several pieces of artillery. At the same time, the country was unfavorable for collecting supplies while in the presence of the enemy's main body, as he was enabled to restrain our foraging parties by occupying the passes of the mountains with regular and local troops. A battle thus became in a measure unavoidable encouraged by the successful issue of the engagement of the first day, and in view of the valuable results that would ensue from the defeat of the army of General Meade, it was thought advisable to renew the attack. In front of General Longstreet, the enemy held a position from which, if he could be driven, it was thought our artillery could be used to advantage in assailing the more elevated ground beyond, and thus enable us to reach the crest of the ridge. That officer was directed to endeavor to carry this position, while General Ewell attacked directly the high ground on the enemy's right, which had already been partially fortified. After a severe struggle, Longstreet succeeded in getting possession of and holding the desired ground. Ewell also carried some of the strong positions which he assailed, and the result was such as to lead to the belief that he would ultimately be able to dislodge the enemy. These partial successes determined me to continue the assault next day. The enemy, in the meantime, had strengthened his lines with earthworks. The morning was occupied in necessary preparations, and the battle recommenced in the afternoon of the 3rd, and raged with great violence until sunset. Our troops succeeded in entering the advanced works of the enemy and getting possession of some of his batteries, but our artillery having nearly expended its ammunition, the attacking columns became exposed to the heavy fire of the numerous batteries near the summit of the ridge and, after a most determined and gallant struggle, were compelled to relinquish their advantage and fall back to their original positions with severe loss. The conduct of the troops was all that I could desire or expect, and they deserve success so far as it can be deserved by heroic valor and fortitude. More may have been required of them than they were able to perform, but my admiration of their noble qualities and confidence in their ability to cope successfully with the enemy has suffered no abatement from the issue of this protracted and sanguinary conflict. Owing to the strength of the enemy's position and the reduction of our ammunition, a renewal of the engagement could not be hazarded, and the difficulty of procuring supplies rendered it impossible to continue longer where we were. The highest praise is due to both officers and men for their conduct during the campaign. The privations and hardships of the march and camp were cheerfully encountered and borne with a fortitude unsurpassed by our ancestors in their struggle for independence, while their courage in battle entitles them to rank with the soldiers of any army and of any time. Their forbearance and discipline under strong provocation to retaliate for the cruelty of the enemy to our own citizens, is not their least claim to the respect and admiration of their countrymen and of the world. I forward returns of our loss in killed, wounded, and missing. Many of the latter were killed or wounded in the several assaults at Gettysburg and necessarily left in the hands of the enemy. I cannot speak of these brave men as their merits and exploits deserve. Some of them are appropriately mentioned in the accompanying reports, and the memory of all will be gratefully and affectionately cherished by the people in whose defense they fell. There were captured at Gettysburg nearly 7,000 prisoners, of whom about 1,500 men were paroled, and the remainder brought to Virginia. Seven pieces of artillery were also secured. 
James Longstreet played a controversial role in the Confederate defeat at the Battle of Gettysburg when he hesitantly oversaw Pickett's charge. It was the sorest and saddest reflection of my life for many years. When your chief is away, you have a right to exercise discretion, but if he sees everything that you see, you have no right to disregard his positive and repeated orders. I never exercised discretion after discussing with General Lee the points of his orders, and when, after discussion, he ordered the execution of his policy. I had offered my objections to Pickett's battle and had been overruled, and I was in the immediate presence of the commanding general when the order was given for Pickett to advance. Many of the survivors remembered seeing General Pickett, shaken and in tears, speaking to General Lee. General Lee, I came to Pennsylvania with one of the finest brigades in the Army of Northern Virginia, and now my people are all gone. They have all been killed. That old man had my division massacred at Gettysburg. One member of the 26th North Carolina remembered that failure. All the men that were not too severely wounded to bear arms were sent from the hospital to their companies. The cooks were given muskets. In fact, everything was done to get as many fighting men in the ranks as possible. The very ground shook. It was simply awful. The bursting of shells. The smoke and the hot sun combined to make things almost unbearable for our men. Our ranks were thinned at every step, and its officers rapidly cut down. In straggling groups, the survivors of that charge gathered in the rear of Seminary Ridge. It was a sad sight. Most of them were bleeding, numbers of them bathing their wounds in a little creek which ran along the valley, making its clear water run red, which others used to quench their burning thirst. I could all but walk over the field on dead and wounded. I have never seen the like before. Mr. Waters Whipple Brahman, captain of the 93rd New York Infantry. The letters were addressed to Brahman's family in Troy, and one was written to his uncle following the Battle of Gettysburg. Dear uncle, we have had an awful fight here, but thank the Lord our army has given the rebels an everlasting thrashing. The heaviest fighting was yesterday, and today they are in full retreat, and our army entire is after them. This is the first time since the organization of the Army of the Potomac that the rebels have met our men in open field, fight, and I don't believe they would this time, but that, as the prisoners say, their officers told them they were to fight the militia, but they found to their cost that the old Army of the Potomac was around. We must have taken about 8,000 prisoners. The loss in killed and wounded on both sides must be 25,000, and some say the rebels alone have lost that number. General Lee tried to come the flag of truce game on General Meade, but it failed to work. General Meade sent back that he would bury their dead for them. We are encamped about one half a mile from Gettysburg, right on the battlefield which is very large. I have seen but very little of it, as we have been momentarily under orders to be ready to move. Mr. Calvin A. Haynes, 125th New York Infantry. One of the letters to Haynes's wife mentioned Gettysburg. Not having heard from you in a great while, I did not know but what you would like to hear, whether I am dead or alive. I am enjoying good health at present. We have had an awful march and a terrible battle. A great many of our boys were killed or wounded, but I escaped without a scratch. It is a miracle that we were not all killed or wounded. We were in the thickest of the fight, making a charge on the Rebs a half a mile through a fire of grape and canister. Our regiment lost a 100 men in 10 minutes. Our corps lost 8 killed and 14 wounded. Stephen Hunt was wounded in the hip. I have not seen him since he fell. Stephen was a good soldier full of his fun. We miss him. This has been the hardest campaign the Army of the Potomac ever had. The second in the afternoon was the bloodiest part of the battle. At 2 p.m. they opened on us. With over a 100 cannon, we lay flat on our faces for two hours. The air was filled with shell bursting in every direction. The battery that lay in front of us had 55 horses and 80 men killed. That night and the next day, the rebels retreated, leaving their dead and wounded on the field. I went over the field. Such a sight I never wish to see again. Every conceivable wound that can be thought of was there. There was so many wounded that it was impossible to attend to all of them. Some of them, laying 48 hours in a drenching rain. It is beyond the power of me to describe a battlefield. William Clark McLean of 123rd New York Infantry. A letter from McLean to his brother. Dear Brother Henry, you are probably going to church, as it is about nine o'clock. I saw DeWitt Perrine yesterday. He was in fight at Gettysburg. Says it was the hardest he ever saw. Lost 26 men in his battery B. I suppose you have heard that Otis Billings was killed and buried on the battleground. We had in our regiment only three killed and three wounded. 
Captain Weir of Hebron Corps was shot in leg, had to be amputated. The rebels lost a good many men there at Gettysburg. I was over the battlefield, the fourth. Our men were burying the dead, put 15 or 20 in one grave or rather hole. Our men were buried separately and headboards put up with names on. In the afternoon of the fourth, we had a hard thunderstorm. I put on my overcoat and sat with my back to a tree and had to just grin and bear it for three hours. I did not get wet through as those did who had no overcoats to put on. James M. Smith of the 149th New York Infantry. Smith, wounded at Gettysburg, was hospitalized at least till November 23rd. For five or six days after my being wounded, it was very difficult and sometimes impossible for me to rise from the ground without help, and I lay without any blanket, but the nights were mild, and I did not suffer from this last deprivation. Our hospital is simply a piece of ground in the form of a square originally designed and used for a campground and barracks for soldiers. The rooms are low, ill-ventilated, there is not a tree or bush on the ground, and the number of seats outside the buildings is very small. Every man who is considered well enough can obtain a pass to go out into town once in three days. General Ulysses Grant was far away from Gettysburg at the time, commanding the Union force that was besieging Vicksburg in Mississippi. I received a telegraphic dispatch from the General Superintendent of Telegraphs, Washington, of the 5th of July stating that Meade had whipped Lee badly and that the latter was retreating and Meade in full pursuit. On November 19, 1863, Lincoln delivered one of the most iconic speeches in U.S. history during the official opening of the Gettysburg National Cemetery. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and press likes.